Okay, so once again, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon for our Teach Educational Rounds. Today we're going to be focusing on It's Time, an Inuit-specific toolkit for tobacco cessation. So here with us today are Megan Barker of Teach. Hi. And um, if you can see, Christine Lund from TI. Do my phone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Christine. <laughs> So, um, as usual, we're just going to go over some housekeeping slides before they get started. So, if you are interested in obtaining a letter of information for this educational round, please make sure that you have registered for the webinar and you are signed in using both your first and last name, and that after this, you complete our evaluation, which I'll be emailing out. As well, these, web webina these webinars are being live tweeted on Twitter. So if you do have Twitter, follow our CAMH Nicotine Dependence Service at PS Quit Smoking. And if you'd like to follow the live tweeting or post your own questions, you can use the hashtag TeachWebinar. So as I mentioned, our presenters today are Megan Barker and Christine Lutz. So Megan Barker is an education specialist for the TEACH Project at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Uh, she currently is a PhD student in the Public Health, Social, Behavioral, and Health Sciences Division at the Dalalana School of Public Health, University of Toronto. And Christine Lund is a coordinator with TI, and um, she's been working there for 12 years and brings with her her talent for event, health promotion, program management, and knowledge of activities grounded in Inuit traditions. So here are our disclosures as well as our presenters' disclosures. The teach curriculum and slides were developed and compiled with funding from the Government of Ontario, Ministry of Long-Term Care, um, and are primarily based on evidence-based guidelines from the following sources. These materials, as well as the verbal presentation and any discussions, set out only general principles and approaches to assessment and treatment and do not replace the need for individualized clinical assessment and treatment plans by healthcare professionals. So uh, before we get started, I'm just going to go through a bunch of uh, polling questions just to sort of gauge who's joined us this afternoon. So in a moment... <laughs> Using uh, your computer, if you could just indicate what your current discipline is. You may need to scroll down on the list. And if yours is not mentioned, you can just type it into the chat box. Awesome. So from the looks of it, it looks like most of us here today are registered nurses. Welcome. <laughs> And um, again, if you could just indicate what region your organization serves. Okay, so we have um, we have a lot of people out of province in Ontario. Where are both of you guys from? None of it. None of it. Okay, New Brunswick. Awesome. Oba, BC. That's great. Yeah, yeah, I think we're joining us <laughs> on Ontario joining. time. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, um, please indicate which of the following that you work for. So a lot of Aboriginal health access centers, hospitals, Other. Other. <laughs> and that also is probably because they're not from Ontario. Yeah, that makes sense. So that makes sense. Consultants, <laughs> nonprofit, lung association, medical evacuation, wonderful. Lots of diversity. Yeah. Well, again, thank you all for joining us. Um, so I'll let our presenters take over. Thank, thank you, Shelley. Thank you very much, Shelley. All so, right. So, Christine, if you want, I can, I can take the driver's seat and move the slides through if you'd prefer. That would be great if you could okay. do that. You can awesome. Do that <laughs> so um, when we were working on this project, our learning objectives were really uh, to create a model and a process of collaborative engagement with Inuit frontline workers, 
educators, health professionals uh, in co-creating an evidence-based and wine-based resource through the guiding principles of two eyes seeing. And uh, as well, we all wanted to highlight a culturally relevant, relevant resource that reflects the needs, concerns, and healing approaches of INI to support tobacco cessation. Um, and then thirdly, we wanted to share feedback from our healthcare providers and clients who reviewed this evaluation toolkit and the materials um, to assess the um, efficacy of, the, of the, the, what was created. Um, so that was, those were our learning objectives. Thanks, Christine. So Christina and I are going to be dancing a little bit back and forth, just so you know. <laughs> Um, so, of course, before we get started, um, I would like to acknowledge the people who were absolutely crucial in uh, making this happen. Uh, before I do that, I just, I've noticed, I've noticed hello? That, that was weird. Like, hello? Sorry. <laughs> Sounds like there's a bit of an echo, um, or it looked, sounded like there was somebody who put us on hold, but I think that has stopped for now, but if it happens again, I'll... I'll, uh, we'll try to address it, but so in terms of, of the acknowledgements, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the engagement circle uh, who are absolutely crucial in um, ensuring that this project happened and they were active participants in terms of reviewing drafts of the toolkit, in participating in reviews, providing resources, and they provided so much amazing knowledge and it's been just absolutely wonderful to work with them over the course of this project. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the healthcare providers and Inuit living in Ottawa who participated in reviewing um, the toolkit materials as well as participating in a pilot session and focus group to provide us with amazing suggestions and feedback and we'll get to that um, towards the end of our presentation today. And of course I'd like to acknowledge um, our funders. Uh, for whom without this would be, this work would not be possible. Uh, so the Bassine Consulting Inc. Uh, Fund for Inclusion in Mental Health, who generously supported the development and, uh, and evaluation of the toolkit. So shout out to all of those wonderful people. And again, just to reiterate, these are members of our engagement circle. Uh, again, they were so crucial in ensuring this project happened, located throughout Canada, I've sent so many emails to them <laughs> and just really happy that they stayed engaged throughout the presentation. And I've noticed that some of you are on the line, so hello and um, excited to share the findings from the project with all of you. Yeah. I also wanted to acknowledge um, the work that Anita really drove on this project. She was really the coordinator for this work, um, working with Megan closely. Um, and I'm I uh, apologize that she's not able to be here today to, to do this presentation, but we'll do the best we can. Yes, yeah. thank you. All right, so um, just for some of you, if you uh, ha aren't aware of Inuit history, it's uh, quite unique. It's not the same as the other Aboriginal or indi Indigenous groups of Canada. Um, tobacco was never part of Inuit culture. Inuit don't smudge. Um, uh, in the, are in a on the tundra in the Arctic. There are no trees, and and the grasses are different. Um, so there was no tobacco for for cultural processes or or ceremonies. Tobacco was introduced by settlers that came into the communities through the fur trade, through whaling um, on ships, and whatnot. And so it wasn't introduced until later on in history. Um, and as part of that history, um, the uh, colonization uh, and um, change in Inuit uh, society began. And with that, unfortunately, came tobacco usage. So just to give you a little bit of a compressed history of contact and the colonist uh, practices that happened, so I don't know if you all know or not, but the, there were disc numbers that were used to identify Inuit. So in the uh, late 1920s um, uh, to 1940s, there were various different methods tried to identify Inuit, to enumerate them. Um, there was a lot of difficulties on the part of uh, the government or RCMP to pronounce Inuit names. Um, so 
there was uh, the final method that they set it on was this distinct numbers. And it's actually assigning a number to an individual um, on a little disc that was stamped with the Canadian crown. Uh, this happened from 1941 to 1972. And it were uh, mandatory. It was They had to have those discs with them at all times. It was to become who they were, rather than the names that they were given when they were born. Um, naming for Inuit is extremely important as it carries on a tradition of family, of, of um, those who came before you, and they're, they're carrying their information and souls with you as well. So the disc really undermined that whole practice and took away a lot of, of cultural identity. Beyond that, there was also geographic location that happened. Um, so uh, Inuit contact really didn't occur until the 1950s. And this was a direct result from the Second World War. Sorry, Ashley. Um, so direct result from the Second World War and um, the Cold War that came after it. Um, so to assert sovereignty over Canada's Arctic, um, the Canadian government relocated Inuit communities, some of them as far as 2,000 miles in distance or kilometers, and to, to resettle and, and assert that sovereignty over a land far in the north. Inuit were not consulted on this. They were not even asked if they wanted to do this. They were given a lot of promises, and it was an arbitrary decision that they had to go. Um, and then there was no real um, way to come back from that either. When they were told they could come back, but then every time they asked for uh, returning to their hometown, they were, they were put off, and that was um, de delayed and delayed and delayed. Um, geographic location also included um, closer, uh, closer relocation. So Inuit are very nomadic, so they traveled with herds uh, around the countryside, but then with this forest location, they were confined to different communities. Communities that may have been a summer camp or a winter camp, but it's not places where families would reside for a long time. Um, and to ensure that families stayed where they were put, as it were, um, their main means of transportation and uh, support to uh, ha hunting and whatnot, their, their dog teams were slaughtered. In the 1950s and 60s, many, many, many dogs were killed, um, and this uh, really hindered any ability for Inuit to go back out onto the land to, to uh, hold, have some sustenance as they were uh, in hunting for their families. So they really became dependent on, on the system. So um, yeah, that's the really quick, 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 short, compact history for Inuit. Thanks, Christine. And you know, the reason why we really want to set the stage with this is because um, these really destructive colonialist practices have led to um, you know, behaviors to help individuals cope with the intergenerational trauma that they still feel to this day. And one of the coping behaviors, um, and as a direct interesting, as Christine mentioned, was introduced by settlers themselves, um, you know, is this idea of the impact of tobacco use. So um, Inuit have very high tobacco use prevalence. Um, uh, the rate is between two or three times higher than other Canadians, depending on the area um, in which uh, the, stat, the statistics come from. Um, because of this, they have some of the highest rates of lung cancer in the entire world, which is pretty um, uh, amazing to think, uh, given the scope of, of our world, and to think that in our country that this is happening is, is pretty devastating. Um, and this uh, impact of tobacco use can begin as young as, um, uh, as when um, Inuit are children. So nearly half of infants, and this stat comes from Nunavut, are admitted to hospital for tobacco-related illness within the first year of their life. So um, this is, like I said, extremely devastating and um, really can be tied to these um, colonialist practices. 
So the reason we decided to do this uh, work, one of the reasons why, is that, that there was really a lack of health interventions that were specific for Inuit. Many of the health interventions that are out there, uh, particularly in the province of Ontario, are really based on uh, the Indigenous cultures that are, are um, inherent for Ontario. So land claims are not, uh, the traditional lands of Inuit are not located here in Ontario. They are all in the north. So, um, you know, it, there was nothing really specific for Inuit here. And this is one of the first reasons why we thought we needed to do this because as time goes by, there are many, many Inuit coming here to Ontario. Um, there, there's some here who are here on short-term basis, some here on long-term basis, and some uh, many Inuit here who have been born here now. They are Ontarians, and they're not. This is their home. So this um, a pan-Aboriginal approach is really not effective, nor is it culturally appropriate. We really need to recognize the the cultural differences and diversity that is in existence here in in Ontario. So, um, so Inuit, like I said, are coming here to Ontario. They're coming to many uh, gateway cities, as it's called, uh, from the north for various reasons. These reasons can range from medical to education, job access, uh, many, many reasons. And then they're, they're having their families here, and then those children are growing up, and they are remaining here. Um, so uh, this is one tool that is, is we're hoping that helps to address a gap that exists in services um, for Inuit. Thanks, Christine. <clears throat> and so really just to, um, to jump off of what Christine was saying, the goal of this toolkit uh, was really to um, enhance the effectiveness of tobacco dependence treatment for Inuit living in Ontario specifically um, by healthcare providers through the development and evaluation of cessation materials reflective of Inuit culture and worldviews. And so our aims, um, we had two, were to first develop culturally relevant tobacco cessation materials to really help build that capacity among healthcare providers to be able to offer and deliver Inuit specific uh, cessation treatment uh, within the province of Ontario. And our second aim was then to really evaluate this process. So evaluate this culturally appropriate method to, to, to provide Inuit specific cessation treatment among Inuit living in Ontario to help them quit or to uh, begin thinking about reducing their tobacco use. So really, uh, the background from this work really stems from uh, the product that you can see on your screen here called It's Time, Indigenous Tools and Strategies on Tobacco Interventions, Medicines, and Education. And uh, this toolkit has been around since the time that I've been at, t at TEACH, at CAMH. It was actually one of the first projects that I've worked, in, worked on, so I feel like everything in my life seems to come full circle, which is kind of really cool. Uh, but when we originally sought out to work on this toolkit, it was really specifically designed for First Nations. And uh, what we've noticed throughout the years is we've received so many requests um, to build capacity and cessation with Indigenous peoples, for both First, First Nations, Inuit, as well as Métis. And so what we were finding um, is when we went to go do these, the trainings uh, with this resource, is that people weren't really feeling connected to it, that it wasn't culturally relevant, that um, some of the protocols, traditions, teachings that were incorporated in the toolkit weren't necessarily relevant to all Indigenous groups, and which, which makes sense. There's so much diversity in terms of, in, in terms of geography, in terms of teachings, um, cultural traditions, uh, language. So, there was no way that this toolkit could possibly be relevant um, for, um, an, uh, for Inuit. So we decided to embark on a really inclusive and open review and retooling process to begin to really look in depth at this toolkit and see where it could go and how we could improve it so that it could be uh, culturally relevant and safe across um, a number of um, Indigenous peoples throughout Canada. And uh, so the first step really for this was an actual review of the toolkit. 
So we um, sent out an invitation to First Nations, Inuit, and Métis stakeholders, elders, healthcare providers, educators, and community members to participate in this really in-depth review. So we had uh, 56 people who were interested in participating in the review, and they represented um, many different provinces and territories. So we um, had um, reviewers from Ontario, Quebec, Newfoundland and Labrador, Northwest Territories, and uh, Nunavut. And we had uh, three opportunities for this review. So we actually um, convened an in-person meeting uh, in Toronto in March 2016. Uh, we also um, sought feedback during a training that we had um, with uh, Inuit healthcare workers and allied professionals in um, Happy Valley Goose Bay, Labrador. So we uh, collected all of their feedback as well. And then we also um, allowed people to submit um, electronic reviews if they were unable to attend um, our in-person meeting. Uh, and so that was great in order to get a wide range of voices and um, experiences and knowledge, which was really crucial in terms of developing this version of the toolkit. And one main finding we, we found once we collated all of the feedback and we have a summary report from from uh, that review is one of the things we found was that we really needed to actually create a new toolkit for Inuit specifically. So instead of creating a toolkit that could be used with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, really to, because there is such diversity in terms of even the history of contact and language and um, as Christine mentioned, tobacco was, has never been considered a sacred medicine among Inuit, that there was a real need to actually develop um, a toolkit by and for Inuit. And so that's what we did. <laughs> so I'll pass it off to Christine who walk, uh, who'll walk you through really what the development looks like. So Megan and I have been in, in discussions for quite some time now. Um, and this project really dovetailed well with another project that we were doing on research around tobacco and tobacco usage. So um, uh, through our discussions, we were able to strike a formal agreement, and that came about in um, October of 2016. Um, and through those discussions, uh, we were able to do um, a partnership agreement. Um, we had an engagement circle invitation that went out, uh, and then the co-creation of our toolkit uh, on the, through the outline that happened uh, in, from January right through to May. Uh, the outline review and approval went in May and June. Um, then we co-created that first draft in June and July. And then we had a review of that draft by, by community members and healthcare professionals in, in August. So, um, it's been a project uh, that has spanned from October to August of this year. So we've got a lot done in a very short time. <laughs> we did. We absolutely did. And um, one of the things that we really wanted to be rooted in was um, a guiding principle and something that, you know, really reflected the way that we were working as well as what we really wanted to be infused actually within the toolkit itself. So um, we kind of relied on this uh, guiding principle of two-eyed seeing. And this is a principle that has come to be through um, Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall. And I've provided the link there below if you want to take a look at some of the amazing work that him and his team um, are doing. But really this concept of two-eyed seeing is that we use both the strengths of evidence-based practice so this is what many of us have been trained in, you know, Western knowledge, the biomedical model, our guidelines that we rely on, as well as wise-based practice, so really specifically Inuit ways of knowing. And we combine these together and see from both eyes, so both our evidence-based practice eye and our wise-based practice eye, to support this strength-based and holistic approach to cessation. Um, and this is kind of the, the principle that guided us through, you know, actually us working together and co-creating the toolkit, as well as really forms the basis of the, of the activities and uh, what's included in the toolkit. So to give you a sense of what we mean by this, I'll first walk you through what our evidence-based practice eye kind of looks like, and then Christine will talk about the wise-based practice eye. 
So in terms of evidence-based practice, we um, used uh, Dermody, Wardell, and Hendershot's group cognitive therapy uh, for smoking cessation manual. And actually, this is what we at the Nicotine Dependence Service use for our, like the format of our cognitive behavioral therapy group. So really taking kind of some of the objectives from that, um, uh, from uh, that manual, as well as some of the activities, um, and instead, you know, maybe adapting them or changing them or really infusing them with Inuit ways of knowing to kind of uh, change uh, the way that they are, that they're actually offered. And uh, we also use Canadap guidelines, so those are the Canadian uh, Tobacco Cessation Guidelines, um, and those were also incorporated um, in the toolkit. And Christine will now talk about wise based practice. So the, the other practices that we included are, are some natural, traditional laws, uh, you know, the natural laws of Inuit, the fundamental laws that are uh, entrenched in Inuit society and that uh, where one respects one's place in the universe, the environment, and in society. And this law really speaks to our interconnectedness in the world and the spiritual supports that are available and to aid our survival. So when we talk about the IQ principles, those are the underpinning of that, that law, those laws. There are two personal IQ principles and six core IQ principles that we, we live by. Um, and they are everything from the concept of serving, serving your family, your community, your, your, um, you know, your surroundings, to consensus decision making, concept of skills and knowledge acquisition, concept of being resourceful, resourceful to solve problems, concept of collaborative relationship and working together for a common purpose, and, and environmental stewardship. And then in terms of personal self, respecting yourself, others, and, and all those around you. And then by fostering good spirits, being open and welcoming and inclusive of all people and things. And by doing all of these things, working in harmony, we're able to live uh, and become inumarik, which means that you're living a life of a genuine person. And that really refers to having the proper attitudes and, um, and engage in proper behaviors towards yourself, other people, animal, animals, and the land itself. So it's really about a balance of, of your well-being. Thanks, Christine. And, you know, you can see how that really makes sense within a group context. And, you know, I'll explain a little bit more about what the activities kind of look like, and so will Christine. But, you know, um, for one, like one example, we use the um, IQ principles as a way to come up with group guidelines with, um, with the group. So, um, you know, focusing on those values and seeing you know, fostering good spirits and being open could be actually like one great group guideline. So um, that's just one example of many of, of how we've used IQ principles within uh, the toolkit. And now, um, uh, so really what the toolkit kind of contents look like are, um, first we have a helper's guide, and this is really kind of the comprehensive guide that a healthcare provider or allied professional could take and really uh, run with offering um, groups or even individual counseling um, with Inuit who are looking to reduce or quit, or quit smoking. And so really what this helper's guide outlines is six 90-minute sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy infused um, with Inuit ways of knowing. Um, we have tried our best to try and incorporate um, some traditional activities, but if you're working with a community that's not necessarily traditional, we also have some Western-focused activities as well. So we've tried to create kind of a balance, and really it's about working with your community to see what is the preference. Um, we have kind of like a backgrounder in the toolkit, which in the helper's guide, which outlines the project development, um, and then basically how it goes is um, in the helper's guide, there's like checklists and um, preparation tools uh, to really get people prepared to be able to offer the activities. Um, it gives you um, times in terms of how long each activity will take. Um, it gives you learning objectives, a purpose behind the activity. So it's really in depth so you can feel comfortable in being able to uh, start to engage uh, right away as soon as you read through the helper's guide. 
Um, the other thing that we um, developed, which was seen as something particularly helpful for um, individuals who are offering groups or counseling all the time, is to, we have this thing called the Helper's Condensed Guide. And this really shows um, one page uh, summaries of the key activities and discussions for each section. So once someone has read in depth through the Helper's Guide, they can just take this like six pager Helper's Condensed Guide with them. Um, and if they're offering one session, they really only need to rely on one page of those six pages. So it's a way to have everything you need on one page so you don't have to go create your own. Uh, the other thing we have is a participant booklet. And this includes all of the information, the handouts, and, work sh and worksheets that correspond to each of the activities we've outlined uh, in the helper's guide. So this is something that you could print and actually uh, give to uh, your participants who then can bring it with them throughout the sessions. Um, or you could just print off the um, activities and information that you feel is relevant for that session. Because the way we've designed this is if it's not feasible for you to offer a group, but you'd like to do some of the activities maybe with, with one client, um, then you, may, you can do that as well. So just focusing on one activity that might be helpful. Um, we also have a uh, helper's resources guide. And this really has all of the um, additional kind of supplements that you may need to help run um, your group or actually do individual counseling. So we have in here things like sample sign-in sheets, um, evaluations, if you wanted to evaluate your session. We have suggestions for icebreakers, um, answer keys for uh, various activities, um, certificates of completion if you know, you're running six groups and then you want to um, recognize people's contributions and attendance with a certificate of completion, you can do that as well. And we also have um, a history of in, in Canada as well as kind of a timeline. Um, of pivotal events, just to give people uh, kind of a grounding um, in Inuit history if uh, perhaps uh, they want to know more or just have that information um, readily accessible. So that's basically what the, there's four uh, main pieces of the toolkit and that's what it looks like. And then Christine's just going to go through what session one and session three could um, include, just to give you a flavor. <laughs> So just, just to give you a, a quick glimpse at what, what you'll be seeing, um, so um, Mae was describing that sort of the one pager that gives you the outline. So this is for session one, and it's really about establishing those guidelines, um, getting to know your group, getting to know yourself. So there's all sorts of activities in there that I could support that. Um, really outlining exactly the process that needs to go so a little bit about the history and the impact of tobacco and in um, in your communities. Um, see, you know, and really bringing it back to culture. So when you're creating the guidelines, you know that the the IQ principle of inclusivity and and being respectful, or um, the other one is being prepared to be to go out. So um, one of the things that we did was uh, create a. a, a a homotic, we're going out hunting, so making sure that we have all of the tools that we need to go on this journey. So applying it back to Inuit culture, what do we need to put on a homotic to get out to do this work to, to ensure that we're, we're doing the best work possible to help um, to stop smoking, to stop using tobacco products. So you know, tying those things back to Inuit culture. And you see in the, in the guide, there's, um, you know, this is the, the snapshot, but in the guide there's more in-depth um, ideas or, or, or thoughts for you to be using. And then keeping track of that information, introducing um, what you need to do. There's track sheets, there's apps for discussions, you know, whatnot. So that, you know, in a nutshell, session one uh, would look like that. Um, and then we, you know, to make to look at another one. So session three, this is our third third one in. You really you review what you've done before, look at what what's happened, how the group has evolved, um, and then really introducing some strategies about how we can help individuals on their journey to cessation, and being culturally specific. Uh, but if they don't want to be. Um, culturally specific. There's also examples of the Western um, approaches to cessation. So, 
there's you have the two two supporting factors to to help people on their journey of, of cessation. Um, and then any supports that are needed uh, to help to do that. So there's you know discussing medications. The, all of those resources are in, included in the guide. Um, there's quiz to help you uh, assess where are your your individuals are, where their knowledge is, and then revisiting that journey. How how do you um, succeed? How what's the impact of quitting? How is that going to impact on your life on other areas? Because it's not just about smoking or, or using tobacco products, there are other impacts, the financial impacts, the impact to your family life, you having to go outside or smoking inside or, you know, lung health, um, all sorts of things that are impacted. And then setting up some goals. Um, and then, you know, I'll wrap up in closing of your session. So it's really short on these quick slides, but in depth in the guide itself um, on the long version to help you on your route to to being able to do this, and in 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 the guide there are some information. There is information about IQ principles um, that's readily available. Um, lots of work that's been done in that area too. Um, yeah. Thanks, Christine. And just to um, add to that, um, Debbie had said you know where there will be a slide on IQ principles. Um, Ashley White, thank you so much. I was just going to say we'll send you a link, but Ashley is on it. Um, so there's a link for you to check out. And like Christine said, we have them fully listed uh, in, the, in the toolkit itself, um, in both, uh, avail available both in English and in the, the, the IQ uh, principles listed there. And there's some great activities um, to connect um, you know, a, a journey to, towards healing um, with those principles. So um, something for you all to check out. Um, and I also just wanted to mention, too, around these sessions is that while we encourage um, individuals, if they're going to be offering them, um, to encourage their uh, participants to, you know, set a behavioral goal, it doesn't have to be, like, a massive goal. Like, it could be something as, you know, maybe trying um, you know, taking your smoking outside or not smoking in uh, your car or uh, whatever makes sense and is relevant and could be potentially doable, um, you know, setting kind of those like SMART goals. And one thing in the language around the toolkit is that everyone is welcome no matter what stage they're at, where they're at in their journey, if they're like, if they haven't even thought about quitting but really just want to come and attend and listen, that's okay too. So just something to, to consider. So after we developed this, we decided to then evaluate it. Uh, so we first started with a healthcare provider evaluation. So we recruited um, 11 healthcare providers to really review this toolkit in depth and provide their, uh, their feedback. So we had uh, two individuals who um, provided a really, really thorough in-depth review along with editorial, editorial edits, thank you so much, um, as well as some um, suggestions for improvement. Um, and then we have nine individuals who submitted their feedback through an online survey. Um, and it was a long survey, 34 items, um, combining uh, both open and closed-ended questions so we could get some qualitative feedback as well as get some ratings on the toolkit. And the specific areas that we assessed were, you know, overall impressions, um, the content and materials, structure and actual, like, feasibility of use, cultural relevance and safety, and also uh, looking at ways to disseminate this. Um, we also offered a pilot session and focus group. So we recruited um, 13 Inuit who used tobacco and were living in Ottawa at the time. Um, they were recruited to attend this. Um, and we actually, we fully facilitated the first session of the toolkit. And this was facilitated by a registered nurse who, um, who works at our clinic here. I'm sure many of you know her, Alexandra Andrick. Um, and also a tobacco-wise lead from uh, Cancer Care Ontario's Aboriginal Tobacco Program, Lisa Beatty. Uh, you may know her as well. Um, and it was really great to have them work together to facilitate this first session and really see it come to life. I was like, this is so exciting. Anita and I were so excited. Um, and then, so really, uh, the participants were invited to share in the focus group what their perception was of the pilot session and um, share some of, like, kind of their initial impressions of the content activities and elicit from them um, some suggestions for improvement. 
Um, each of the participants received uh, the participant booklet, uh, lunch and snacks, honoraria, as well as a gift to really acknowledge um, the, their shared knowledge. And we, um, we gave each of them um, of what's called a bracelet of strength um, from Wee Tung Ojibwe uh, Center located um, at Curve Lake First Nation. They have amazing, beautiful, um, like just the most amazing gifts and, and artwork, and so check them out. That's my plug for them. <laughs> they have great stuff. And um, really with this bracelet of strength is each, it's made of, um, from deer skin, and each um, braid in, um, each strand in the braid represents something different. So one is courage, one is dedication, and really one is like belief to stay on this path, this new journey. And really uh, braided together, they create this bracelet of strength. And so um, it has a great message and uh, the participants loved it. So um, just thought I'd share that little tidbit. So I'm just gonna walk you through some of the toolkit review findings to get a sense of what the healthcare providers as well as what the um, the um, uh, living in Ottawa, uh, their thoughts on the, the toolkit. So in terms of the survey, these are some of the mean scores across um, all of the survey domains. So in terms of the content and materials, there was a score of 4.42 uh, out of five, where five equals highest best. Um, structure and feasibility of use was 4.33. Uh, cultural relevance and safety, 4.20. And then um, in terms of dissemination and capacity building, 4.41. So um, great scores, and the overall mean score for the toolkit was a 4.75 out of 5. So this is really reassuring um, to hear from the reviewers that you know this this toolkit would um, will be helpful um, even beyond for perhaps the context of Ontario. So and that's exactly um, what we wanted to hear, and it's great to hear. Um, 67, um, almost 67 percent of the participant of the uh, reviewers. Um, believe that the relevant issues were included, and nearly 78% uh, felt that this toolkit would remain relevant for at least three years or more. In terms of the qualitative findings, um, you know, we collated all of the feedback and then we um, kind of grouped them in a number of key themes. And so one of the key themes that we noticed was this notion of choice. So the healthcare providers were really pre pleased to see that there were you know, lots of options that uh, facilitators could choose from in terms of being able to, you know, offer these sessions with different people, um, regardless of where they're at in their quit journey. Um, and they also really liked that, you know, that there was a lot of different moving parts to the toolkit so that if people really wanted like a thorough in-depth look at it, that they would have that available or just have, um, you know, kind of a one-pager to guide them. And then the participants provided a lot of great feedback in terms of providing them with more choice. So more activities that really reflected what they needed to, to have available. In terms of cultural relevance and safety, um, we had uh, many of the healthcare providers as well as the participants say that you know, this toolkit was really aligned with Inuit ways of knowing and the IQ principles. Um, happy to see that you know, relevant uh, materials were included and, and referenced so that, um, you know, uh, healthcare providers and, and allied professionals can really learn more and seek out more of the information that's already available, but now here's a place where everything is kind of um, hopefully intertwined into one document. Um, and also provided some great suggestions of improvement in terms of being able to um, really ensure a culturally relevant and safe toolkit. So one participant said, you know what, the group maybe offer some traditional food, have an elder open and close, and so many of these suggestions of improvement have been included in the toolkit. Um, so the voices of these individuals have also been um, since included. Um, in terms of the um, capacity building theme, this is really about supporting helpers as well as supporting uh, clients. So one thing in terms of supporting helpers would be to potentially engage um, a community member or a peer um, in terms of co-facilitation of these groups or in uh, potentially counseling. So, you know, someone who has potentially successfully quit or, um, you know, has this like lived experience and can really help support um, 
really helps support uh, the facilitation of the, the group or session. Um, as well as um, well, a lot of things, um, one theme that kept coming up among the participants was not really knowing and needing to know more about the physical, uh, mental, emotional health effects of uh, tobacco. So, you know, actually being able to see and visualize what a healthy lung and a smoking lung looks like was something that um, was of interest and of great need to uh, the participants. So supporting that capacity for building in terms of learning more um, about what the, uh, the impacts of tobacco um, can really have. In terms of access, this relates to both um, being able to access the toolkit as it is, as well as being able to access sessions. So um, one of the focus group participants says, you know, not everybody uses computers or social media. So promoting this tool, uh, you know, if you're doing a group session, promoting it that way might not actually be that helpful. And that really having, spreading it through word of mouth or, you know, uh, promoting it at drop-in centers is one way to really, like, get more reach. Um, participants also said that offer us incentives and we'll come. So um, one thing they said, you know, in, besides just offering food, but maybe like offering gum. So being able to chew um, can help get their mind off of smoking. You can imagine sitting for 90 minutes is not easy. And you do need to think about incorporating breaks in between, um, especially people who are smoking multiple cigarettes a day, that sitting for that 90 minutes is not going to be possible. So we incorporated breaks. We had food, we had drinks, having water, gum, you know, something to kind of get, um, you know, distract and delay from, from wanting to smoke. Um, and then the other thing we noticed um, was healthcare providers mentioning that um, uh, in the future we should do a plain language review of the toolkit to really ensure that it's accessible to everybody. So that's one thing hopefully we will we'll do in the future, uh, pending funding. Um, but um, of course, we'd like to hear your feedback as well as you go through the materials and can notice any quick changes that we could potentially make. My favorite slide, and this is about the impact. So um, meeting these individuals um, at the focus group, they were just incredible. And um, seeing even just over the 90-minute session how, like, the environment changed and then doing the focus group and, and hearing, you know, you started to see, like, the wheels kind of, like, turning or people starting to think about what they were going to do differently. And even just after this 90-minute session, it was really apparent that um, there was some impact that was had. And so... Um, some participants even set goals for themselves. One said she was gonna, she's not, she's not gonna smoke in her van anymore, a place where she smokes a lot. Somebody said they're gonna try the tracking sheet and see where that takes them. Um, you know, participants remarked on the fact that they felt like they weren't alone and that they liked the program because it showed that there was a better way than, um, than to, you know, there's a better way you, to quit smoking rather than to keep going. And the other piece, too, and really just kind of, you know, we can't underscore the, like, the importance of family and community in um, supporting a quit journey. And so one participant said that he really liked that he was glad to hear that his nieces and nephews could be a motivational reason for him to quit. So really bringing it back to the family, bringing it back to the community, um, and that's, you know, potentially one way that there can be um, some impact. So that was amazing to see. And then uh, Christine just going to talk a bit about the toolkit edit. Yeah. So when we did the review, both with healthcare professionals and with the focus group, there were actually 73 edits that were identified um, for implementation. Now we were able to implement about 80% of those suggestions, um, and we have 15 edits still outstanding. It's just not currently feasible. Some of those uh, edits that we haven't been able to um, complete. Uh, have to do with uh, translations, actually. So translating the toolkit uh, into Inuktitut that will be used for Inuit no matter where they're from. Unfortunately, there are many dialects that are across the north, so it makes it difficult to decide which dialect are we going to use to be able to do that. Um, so we're, we're really looking at that closely to find out where, what should we actually do, what's the best solution for that to, to be able to do that. Now the other large um, component to that um, that was came back from healthcare professionals um, as well as, as focus group is about the language. 
um, the use of plain language. So uh, we are currently working on, um, but it hasn't been, it's not completed, is uh, having the whole kit reviewed for plain language by an expert to, to help guide us in that work as well. Thanks, and I'm sure you're wondering, well, where can I access this toolkit <laughs> that you've been talking about for the last 50 minutes? Um, well, it's, it's live. It's available on the Teach Project website. Um, it just went up, I believe, like yesterday. So um, if you just go to www.teachproject.ca, you can click on Toolkits, and it'll pop up as one of the subheadings. I believe it says um, Inuit uh, Toolkit. Um, and so it's located there on the website. And I wanted to mention that we have uh, both Microsoft Word as well as PDF versions available. And the reason for us having these Microsoft Word documents available is so that you can change the language, you can make updates, you can add your own resources, you can really tailor it um, to meet the needs of your own community. Uh, because we didn't want to just give you the PDF and then you have to like, add in additional, you know, items and, and bring different handouts with you. Really, this is about making this useful for you and your communities. So um, having those Microsoft Word documents were really important to us. So you can just click and download. Um, and if downloading is a barrier, as we know it can be in some communities, we do have um, USBs available. So you can just email us at teach at chemh.ca or you can email myself and we can see about getting um, a USB out to you. But just wanted to know, let you know that that was an option. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do um, with this toolkit, what do we want to go from here? We really want to promote it. We want to uh, distribute it and disseminate it across Ontario and any other areas, uh, regions that people would like to try it out in. Uh, we want to try and get those uh, remaining edits implemented. Um, and then hold additional pilot sessions. You know, we had one, and we know that there's an additional need to evaluate the, the t toolkit um, as we go along um, and find out really uh, what is the, its effectiveness. So um, evaluate on a large scale once it's disseminated. When we, if we could get some feedback um, about the kit itself, about your sessions, um, if you're going to use it with any. Let us know how it's, how it's going or, or what things may or may not have worked and to help us to, to make the best possible product. Um, so there will be an availability to collect feedback from you on an ongoing basis. Um, so we really appreciate if you, would to, if you could do that for us. Absolutely. And so really that brings us kind of to the end of our presentation and we're happy to take any and all questions. and. Uh, yeah, hopefully this is helpful. <laughs> There's someone typing. <laughs> and I, I just, I want to go up to and just make sure that we didn't um, miss any of the other questions. Um, so, um, Somebody asked if we can get a copy of the slides, and I think that's okay provided, I know Christine, we had some images in there that are TI, so would you like us to strip those first and then send them out, or what are you comfortable doing? Um, I think we'll take a look at that and then, and then uh, have an uh, end product that we can ship out around uh, once okay. we've, we've talked about that. Sure, sounds good. So just stay tuned, um, and we'll let you know about that shortly. Um, so the, okay, do you have the toolkit on DVD or CD? No, it's available for download currently on the Teach Project website. But like I said before, if downloading is a barrier, uh, then uh, we can offer a USB if that is, um, if, if that works. Um, in terms of languages, we already discussed that. Um, so it's, currently available in English. Um, we have some of the participant resources in, uh, in Nuktatut, uh, mainly just the IQ principles. But like Christine said, there's, we're still trying to uh, determine um, which dialects uh, in terms of translation and, and see where that goes pending future funding. I think that is all from here. I think um, a lot of thank yous. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, a lot of things. But there was a question about um, a child resource, a resource for children. Resource for children. Where did you see that? Hold on. From Let me open it. Lawrence. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Oh, um, Betty, within the Chinese immigrant community, sometimes I hear children would see their elders who smoke as losers. Would there be a resource for children to be supportive of their family members for improvement? Um, not with this toolkit. It was really designed, um, it wasn't designed specifically for youth and children, um, for, you know, people I would say maybe 18 or older. Um, but Christine, do you know of any like resources for children specifically that are available? Well, um, I think um, so. Sarah just um, put her link on there as well for the Nunavut uh, Tobacco Reduction Program uh, oh, on their awesome. website. So uh, they have many products, and I think um, well, I'm not she's going to answer us here in a second. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, there are items in there that, that could be useful. For sure. Um, I think you'd have to look at the website itself, but uh, we currently don't have any. Uh, it's, it's just we're at the beginning stages. Oh, there you go. See? And you quit. That's, yeah, there are children's resources there. I thought I'd seen some, but I didn't want to say absolutely for sure. So. Uh, that's awesome. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and I wanted to mention too, so Naomi asked, does the toolkit promote calling the Nunavut quit line? It promotes every quit line across Canada. So um, every quit line that there is available across um, the country, we've included um, a link to the website as well as uh, the corresponding telephone number. Um, and that's available in the participant tool, um, the participant booklet. So um, in the participant booklet, there is a list of not only quit lines, but also um, lines um, available specifically um, for Indigenous peoples related to seeking trauma counseling and counseling as it relates to residential schooling. Um, so we've tried to create um, include a diversity of resources to support, um, you know, at many different levels, even beyond tobacco. So um, that's in there as well. Um, I hope. Oh. There's a question about the cool buy-in for Inuit, wondering how, what the percentage of writers and reviewers who were Inuit. Um, so the focus group was entirely uh, all Inuit here in, in Ottawa who reviewed the, the toolkit. The toolkit was um, the reviewed and co-written um, by Anita, who is Inuk as well from Nunavut. Um, she helped us on this project. So it has a lot of input uh, from Inuit. They were the, the major the major driving factors for this for this resource. For sure. And many of the members of the engagement circle either identify as Inuk themselves or work directly with Inuit and live in Inuit communities. So um, their voices were um, you know, definitely super important in terms of them providing us with resources, um, you know, clarifying um, specific um, things and providing ideas for uh, culturally relevant and safe activities. So um, there were many um, uh, Inuit involved in, in this project. And for those of us who provide smoking cessation education on a one-to-one -one basis, does the toolkit provide guidance? So like I said before, this toolkit can be used both in a group or an individual, um, or an individual um, setting. So, um, and there is some language in the toolkit uh, around what that could potentially look like. Um, so you may pick and choose to decide to use specific activities on a one-to-one -one, um, basis. And really the discussion then would just be had with you, know, you and, uh, the, uh, and your client. But we've made it flexible enough that really it's about picking and choosing what works best for you. And, um, you know, we, we're anxious and, and hopeful to hear from you about how, how it goes and, and, if, and if it's working. So, um, yeah, we appreciate hearing your, we look forward to hearing your input, I should say. So we have one minute left. Um, if there are no other questions, then I'm just going to go through the remaining slides, which I promised Shaliza I would do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, just 
please again remember um, a link to the evaluation um, will be sent to email will be sent um, to your email uh, by 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today. And if you participated as a group, please make sure to email teach at canmakes.ca with a complete list of participants. Um, and just to let you know, for our future upcoming webinars, we're doing an update on uh, Cytosine, which is exciting. Um, that's happening Wednesday, October 11th from 12 to 1, um, again, Eastern Standard Time. And we're also offering a second October webinar, so lots of webinars in October. Um, this is uh, Mood Management Part 2. So we did Part 1, I believe, last month, and this will be kind of a follow-up to that. And registration will be opening soon. So again, um, and this session has been recorded, so if you want to share with a colleague, you can absolutely do that um, in our archives. That should be available um, soon as well. And really, again, just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Christine, from Ottawa. Thanks, Megan. We'll talk to you later. Bye, everybody. Bye now.